Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And the idea for today's video sort of came out of what I was talking about last week. I'm going to leave last week's video linked in a card up here. But in that video, I talked about Mary the First and I particularly focused on her rather unfortunate moniker that has gone down in history, namely Bloody Mary. I was asking whether or not she'd actually earned that title. Was she really all that bloody? Particularly if we compare her to what came before and after her. I also talked about Henry VIII's absolute desperation for a male heir. And I explained that perhaps it was understandable because female queenship in its own right had been an experiment that had arguably failed. If the early modern people looked back to the example of the Empress Matilda, she and her cousin Stephen had been involved in a civil war known as the Anarchy that had engulfed all of England as they attempted to figure out who would hold sway and power over the English throne. Ultimately, Matilda was defeated and Stephen won the day. And so perhaps, therefore, we have a reason. They've tried female queenship, it was an abject failure, so now no more female queens, clearly. But as I pointed out in that video, when Stephen died, it was Matilda's son who took the throne. So while she may not have exercised monarchical power in her own right successfully, she does manage to secure a position whereby it is her direct bloodline that ends up holding sway and winning the day. Stephen may have won the battle, but arguably Matilda won the war. So while I think we can perhaps understand why Henry and his courtiers may have been reticent about putting women on the throne, what he actually leaves behind is arguably, based upon evidence, a far more dangerous thing. We have one example of a failed female queen ruling in her own right, but Henry leaves behind a boy of nine to rule the whole of England. And there are far more examples in English history of the failure of kings who come to the throne as boys than there are of queens ruling in their own right. And so today I want to talk about boy kings and the potential danger they pose. Before I delve into this topic, I need to offer a note on the terms that I'm going to be using. Some of the boy kings that I'm going to refer to today come from a period of British history before the Norman Conquest, during the early medieval period. Some of my UK viewers might be confused as to why I'm not calling it the Anglo-Saxon period, because after all, that is how we know it. And it is. In the UK, the term Anglo-Saxon is not loaded in the way that it apparently is, for example, in the US. I'm aware that I have quite a large percentage of my viewership coming from America. I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us from across the pond. And I've been watching those debates with interest. The fact that this term is loaded in ways in the US that it simply isn't in the UK, that in the way it's loaded it causes pain and alienation, is for me a reason not to use it in this video. I certainly would never want anything I say to make somebody feel upset, alienated or in pain. And so for me, it just feels better to change the term. But at the same time, I don't want my UK viewership to be confused. I am referring to the period that you know of, however I am just using the terms early medieval or pre-Norman rather than Anglo-Saxon. Firstly, we're going to be looking at the notion of success and I think in the case of the boy kings that we're going to be exploring, we have to acknowledge that success and failure is perhaps in the eye of the beholder. What looks like a successful monarchy to me may seem a failure to you. Is the successful king a peacekeeper or a warmonger? Does success look like dying in your bed at a ripe old age, still king, with a son to succeed you successfully and maybe even a spare heir in the wings should the unthinkable happen? Or is the success of a king measured purely by the acts of his reign? That he finds his country in one state but leaves it in a better one? I'd love to know what you think, so do let me know in the comment section down below. The Bible has a stark warning, it seems, against boy kings. If we look here at the King James Version of the Bible, Ecclesiastes 10, 16. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, 
and thy princes eat in the morning. But does the Bible have a point? I'm going to start with those pre-Norman boy kings, of which there are five that I wish to explore. First up, we have Edwig. He is born in around 940, and he becomes king at just 15 in 955. He rules for just four years. His monarchy is beset by feuds with both his noble and churchmen. These churchmen included the Archbishops Dunstan and Oda. Dunstan is perhaps more famously referred to as Saint Dunstan, and he was exiled during the reign. In 957, this boy king loses the allegiance of the Mercians and possibly the Northumbrians with them, which divides England. These kingdoms now become loyal to his younger brother, Edgar, who rules these lands in his place. He dies in October 959, having not produced a male heir of his body to succeed him. He is just 19 years old and is buried at Winchester. Edward has acquired a reputation as a debaucher, an opponent of monasticism, a despoiler of the church and an incompetent ruler, which derives from the account of him in the earliest life of St Dunstan, written around 1000, and from the later sources which elaborate the same themes. It is the case, however, that Aidwig quarrelled with Dunstan and sent him into exile, and it may be doubted whether a life of the saint would provide impartial evidence for the life of the king. His younger brother Edgar was born in around 943, and he had been recognised as king of the Mercians and possibly the Northumbrians from the age of about 14. He becomes king of all England from 959, when he is 16 years old, with the death of his brother. By ascending to his brother's throne, he reunites the kingdom that his brother seems by his actions to have split. He is known in history as Edgar the Peaceful. He produces at least three surviving sons. It seems he has done all he can to secure the succession and his nation. When Edgar died, he was around 31 or 32, on the 8th of July, 975. And his eldest son did succeed him to the throne, although, as we will find out, his rule was contested. It seems that Edgar's arm was not only long, but also heavy. His reign came to symbolise a golden age of peace and plenty, exemplified by the epithet Pacificus, which first appears in the 12th century chronicle of John of Worcester. Whether things were so comfortable for those who lived through it probably depended upon the point of view. Edgar's eldest son, Edward, was born in around about 962 making him 13 years old when his father died and he ascended to the throne. As I mentioned, his succession to the throne was contested. Rather ominously, he is known to history as Edward the Martyr. His reign ends on the 18th of March, 978, when he was around 15 or 16 years old. He was murdered at Corfe Castle in uncertain circumstances. Corfe Castle was the home of his younger half-brother, Ethelred. For this reason, Edward's stepmother is implicated in his murder, perhaps having hoped to get her son on the throne. Alternatively, another motive for his murder has been given as his apparently quarrelsome character. Edward is also known to have been very much in favour of monasticism in England, so anybody who was of the anti-monastic persuasion may also have had a motive to kill him. Edward dies without producing any children, and so that half-brother of Corfe Castle, Ethelred, becomes king after him. Edward died too young to have had much influence on government on his own account, and political affairs remain firmly in the hands of Elderman Elfhair. Edward's power base seems to have been very restricted when compared with that of his father. Ethelred, known to history as Ethelred the Unready, was born in around 966. The murder of his brother Edward makes him king when he was just 11 or 12. His reign was beset by conflict with Denmark. Danish raids on English territories led to the massacre of Danish settlers in 1002. Perhaps as a result of this, the Danish king Sven Forkbeard invaded and ruled England from 1013 to 1014. After his death, Ethelred returned to the throne from 1014 to his own death on the 23rd of April 1016. Ethelred was succeeded by his son Edmund Ironside for a few months before Edmund's own death. He was then replaced by Sven's son, Canute. However, Ethelred the Unready had other children. He was also the father of Edward the Confessor by his second wife, 
and Edward the Confessor became king in 1042 until 1066. Edward the Confessor died without children in 1066 and following his death the succession to the English throne was highly contested. It was a period of strife, invasion and war. The most famous of these is arguably the Battle of Hastings, part of the Norman conquest of England. Ethelred's posthumous reputation has rendered him synonymous with bad rulership and left him a figure of fun. In the final analysis, it is as difficult to decide what credit, if any, Ethelred can take for the positive aspects of his reign as it is to apportion blame for its manifestly disastrous outcome. It is enough, however, to suggest in this way that there was more to Ethelred than the familiar tale of Viking invasions exacerbated by incompetence, treachery and intrigue in high places. Unequal to the challenge that confronted him and unfortunate in the circumstances that engulfed him, but always more interesting than merely unready. In addition to being the end of the pre-Norman period, the year 1066 was also a year where we could have had another boy king of England. Edgar the Aetheling was born in around 1052. He was the grandson of Edmund II, and he was just 14 years old when King Harold Godwinson was killed at the Battle of Hastings. In his place, many of the nobles elected Edgar the Aetheling to be king after him. Edgar would eventually submit to William the Conqueror in December 1066. Nevertheless, he was involved in rebellions against William's rule between 1068 and 1070, having fled to the court of Malcolm II in Scotland. Eventually, it seems he adapts to Norman rule and even makes friends with William the Conqueror's sons, Robert and William. It is perhaps questionable whether we should even include Edgar the Aetheling as a boy king. Although he was named as such, it was during a time of invasion. William was already on English soil. Harold Godwinson had been killed and William never went away. And eventually, as we know, Edgar submits to him. So do you even think he counts as an English king? Let me know in the comments section down below. Certainly, Edgar lacked the force of personality to impose himself upon events in the period between 1066 and 1074. Although he was handicapped by political isolation in 1066 and the disunity of the English leaders, Edgar's death occurred without record. Henry III was born on the 28th of October, 1207. He became king after the death of his father, King John, in 1216. Henry III was just nine years old, and the Barons' War of 1215 to 1217 was underway. His reign is characterised by his piety. However, as a king, he is known for lacking military success or diplomatic skill, either at home or abroad. He did, however, reign for a very long time. But in 1258, when Henry was aged 51, his half-brothers, the Lusignans, held sway, and they were widely unpopular. Because of this, and potentially the other failings of Henry III's monarchy, the barons, led by Simon de Montfort, rebelled in 1263. Henry's forces were defeated by Simon's at the Battle of Lewis in 1264, and Henry was imprisoned. Henry's son, Edward, escaped de Montfort and defeated him the next year, managing to free his father. Henry's desire for vengeance was only mollified by the intercession of his clergy, but the peace in England was an uneasy one. When Henry died on the 16th of November 1272, he was 65 years old. Henry is buried in Westminster Abbey, and his son, the man who had escaped de Montfort and freed him, succeeded him as Edward I. Henry was essentially a man of peace, kind and merciful. His peacefulness was both a strength and a weakness. He hoped to learn from John's diplomatic mistakes. He also hoped, naively, to imitate the chivalry of Louis IX. But the mystique of monarchy to which Henry aspired was an outward show designed to bind him to his magnates. Neither in theory nor in practice did he challenge their liberties. Indeed, he helped to set fashions for aristocratic luxury for the rest of the century. Edward III was born on the 13th of November, 1312. He became king at age 14, following the deposition of his father, Edward II, by his mother, Isabella, and her lover, Roger Mortimer. Isabella and Roger Mortimer acted as regents for Edward III until the 19th of October 1330. On this date, Edward seized power, 
just before his 18th birthday. In the final assessment, it remains uncertain whether Edward III can indeed be credited with an overall political strategy. He rarely indulged in grand statements of constitutional theory, and many of his acts of government were merely designed to placate a political community whose moral and material support was so vital to his military enterprises. On the other hand, with rare exceptions, he achieved enormous and remarkable success in inspiring the loyalty of his subjects. His reign marks one of the longest periods of domestic peace in the history of medieval England. By all accounts, Edward III was a fairly traditional, war-loving medieval king. He managed to die in his bed, aged 64, on the 21st of June 1377, with a male of his bloodline to succeed him afterwards. This was his grandson, Richard, the son of his son, Edward the Black Prince. That grandson became Richard II. He had been born on the 6th of January 1367, when he ascended to his grandfather Edward III's throne on the 22nd of July 1377, he was just 10 years old. His was a crisis hit reign. In 1381, Richard was only 14 years old when the Peasants' Revolt broke out. Nevertheless, he behaved with bravery and was seemingly integral in putting that rebellion down. As it would turn out, however, whatever diplomacy he may have possessed in dealing with his peasants, court would not be so easy, and factional division damaged his rule. His cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, had been exiled and disinherited. Because of this treatment by his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke rebelled. He forced Richard to abdicate his throne and then replaced him as king on the 29th of September 1399. Henry Bolingbroke became Henry IV. Henry IV seems to have been originally keen to let the former king live, but plots for his rescue made this seem unwise. It is believed that Henry IV, or someone supporting him, let Richard II starve to death the following year, on or around the 14th of February 1400. Richard II was 33 years of age. In explaining his eventual downfall, both contemporaries and modern historians have focused attention on the unwisdom and extremism of his actions in the last two years of his reign, when he sought to impose his own concept of kingship on a reluctant community, and to enforce his authority by means considered by many in the community as barely lawful. When Henry Bolingbroke claimed the throne on the 30th of September 1399, he maintained that the realm was on the point of being undone for default of governance and undoing of the good laws. Richard's rule from the summer of 1397 onwards was characterised by a combination of ideology and a sense of insecurity, which in the eyes of his opponents amounted to a lack of good governance, and for this he was rejected. Henry IV's grandson, Henry VI, was born on the 6th of December 1421. He became king at just nine months old, following his father, Henry V's death. Henry VI seems to have been the diametric opposite of his confident, aggressive, warlike father. He is perhaps best known for his bouts of catatonic mental instability and also for the civil war that ravaged his reign. The so-called War of the Roses erupted in 1455. In March 1461, Edward, Earl of March, defeats the Lancastrian forces to become the Yorkist king, Edward IV. Edward IV's reign was secured when his forces defeated Margaret of Anjou's resistance fight and managed to imprison Henry VI in the Tower in 1465. Nevertheless, discord between Edward IV and Warwick, named the Kingmaker, led to some side-swapping, which saw Henry VI released from the Tower and restored to the throne in 1470. Edward IV fled England. But in the following year, 1471, Edward IV returned to England and defeated the Lancastrian forces again. Henry VI was once more imprisoned in the Tower of London. And on the 21st of May, 1471, when he was aged 49, it was there that he died. The alleged cause of death was, in quotes, melancholy apparently following the news of the loss of the Battle of Tewkesbury, at which his only son, Edward, had been killed. However, many suspect that he was actually murdered. No king who loses his crown and dies in prison, and whose reign ends in civil war, can be counted a success. 
Henry VI was not a robust ruler who left a consistent stamp on the workings of government. Though to dismiss recorded expressions of his opinions and will as mere administrative convention goes too far. Henry lost his crown at the outset of a dynastic civil war, but to regard him, as many writers have done, as directly and solely responsible for the Wars of the Roses fails to take fully into account the circumstances of Henry's own life and the age in which he lived. The son of that deposing king, Edward IV, would come to be known as Edward V. He was born on the 2nd of November, 1470. Edward IV's death on the 9th of April, 1483, made his son king at just 12 years old. As it would turn out, this king would never have a coronation. Indeed, for a more detailed chain of events of what happened after Edward V accedes to the English throne, you should check out my video on Richard III, which I will leave linked in a card. Nevertheless, the climax of these events came on the 26th of June, 1483, because on this date, Edward V's uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, took his seat in Westminster as Richard III. Edward V had had no coronation, nor would he have one. He and his younger brother, Richard, Duke of York, were held in the tower, and from that place they went missing. They are still missing, presumed dead, and their uncle, Richard, is a prime suspect for their disappearance and or murder. Henry VIII was born on the 28th of June, 1491. His father died on the 22nd of April, 1509, meaning that Henry VIII became king just before his 18th birthday, which technically, at least, if nothing else, classifies him as another boy king. He was, however, keen to rule in his own right, which may go some way to explain his swift marriage to Catherine of Aragon. He saw himself as a man and wanted to rule as one. Becoming a husband so quickly was a prime way of doing this, perhaps. His reign was marred by foreign and also national conflict. He was responsible for a religious schism that endangered his nation and almost split it in two. His marital strife is and was a legendary source of embarrassment. He was beset by personal ill health that seems to have altered his personality, making him irascible, untrusting and tyrannical. If that isn't enough, he is also responsible for debasing the English coinage, damaging its reputation overseas and making foreign trade incredibly difficult and expensive. Nevertheless, Henry VIII dies in his bed on the 28th of January 1547, when he was 55 years old. He had provided England with that long-form male heir who survived to succeed his father. Henry VIII's son, Edward, was born on the 12th of October, 1537, to Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour. With Henry's death on the 28th of January, 1547, Edward becomes Edward VI. At this point, he is just nine years old. He would only live until the 6th of July, 1553. He died when he was 15. Because he dies at just 15, Edward never reaches his majority. He is never allowed to rule completely on his own. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why the character of his kingship will always be somewhat obscured to us. Another factor may also be the strength enjoyed by his Regency Council. This Regency Council that had been put in place because of Edward's youth was a source of danger for the security and stability of the nation. Because within this council, faction could grow and conflict could arise. The first head of the Regency Council had been Edward's uncle, also named Edward, Edward Seymour, Protector Somerset. He attempted to rule seemingly with an iron fist. His rule, however, became unpopular, and he was eventually overthrown by another member of the council, John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland. Edward, it seems, was simply too young to keep his house in order. Edward VI died in his bed, not having produced an heir of his body, and as we would see, his plans for the succession fell apart within weeks of his death. The examples of these 12 boy kings is for me statistically interesting. I am comfortable with calling seven of their reigns a failure. I'm not sure where I sit in the case of two of them, whether I'd call it a success or a failure. That leaves just three, 
that I can confidently call a success. So for me, statistically, that points to the fact that having a boy ascend to the English throne is far more dangerous than having a woman sit on it. We have just that one example, the Empress Matilda, whose reign as a regnant queen falls apart because of her sex. Nevertheless, it is still her heir that ends up holding the English throne after her. Think about how many in that 12 would have hoped for the same thing to happen to them, but they were not successful. Seven out of 12 ending in failure is statistically interesting. And it makes me wonder, Henry's obsession about getting a male heir, we used to explain away by talking about the failure of female rule in the past. But does that mean that Henry could possibly have been confident as he entered his last weeks, as he becomes increasingly aware that he is going to leave behind a boy to follow him? Can we really think that he's going to be all that happy about it? If he is worried about the history of female queenship, surely he must have also been worried about what happens to boy kings. Let me know what you think about that in the comments section down below, or come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave links to my Instagram and my Twitter in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.